This is something to talk about from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. And we do this program Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and occasionally other days as well. Keep an eye out on our website. It's sponsored by Fieldstone Memory Care of Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone offers innovative and compassionate care, and they are accepting residents. Call 360-271-2530 to schedule a tour of Fieldstone's beautifully appointed apartments at Rolling Bay today. And today we're going to learn a little bit about the Bainbridge Artisan Resource Network's Metal Fabrication Studio and studio lead David Hayes is here with us. Hi, David. Thank you, Reed. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, and indeed I do serve as the uh, metal fab the barn metal fabrication studios lead. And so I manage a uh, cadre of about uh, 15 volunteers uh, or so regular volunteers. Then we make up the team of the uh, keep the metal fabrication studio uh, running. So I've got a bit of a slideshow here to walk through and I'll be talking about uh, what we do there and some of our capabilities and some of the fun we have. And so uh, without any further ado, I'll need to get in here and share the screen. What we do uh, at uh, in the Metal Fab uh, Fabrication Studio, uh, we are made up of uh, uh, several shops, but we have a forge and foundry, and then we have a machine shop. And then we also have what we uh, call the Jack Archer uh, workshop where we do plasma cutting, welding, uh, and sheet metal. And so let me get to the next screen here. And so what we have here, the machine shop and the, and the green, and um, we have lathes and mills, and we can talk a little bit more about that if we want. And we have both manual machines and we have CNC machines. CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control. And so we feed a program into that machine and then it carries out uh, the uh, moves and cutting operations that we want. And then we also have a 3D printer in that machine shop and many other things as well, a lot of support equipment. And then uh, we also have then uh, on the Forge and Foundry and that is done in cooperation with Alchemy Industrial Arts. Uh, and that's uh, Jeremy, um, Jeremy Lorch and he uh, does a, a great job. Uh, he's, he's had uh, kids around for years uh, come into his shops and he teaches them stuff. But we are, uh, we work with him and to do our, uh, to host our forge and foundry operation. And then in the Jack Archer workshop or JAWS, uh, we have sheet metal welding and plasma cutting. And so let's start out with uh, Jeremy's operation. Uh, we're at the forge. Um, the forge is where you apply heat uh, to metal and then you use hammer and tongs to shape and uh, shape the metal to the shape that you want, form it to the shape you want. And then finally, uh, what you would do then is put any finishing touches on that as you see over in the far right hand side. And this was uh, a uh, it's, this was a traditional knife making class. And uh, that's what one of the students created. And it's very pretty, very elegant. Uh, and uh, uh, Jeremy was just tickled by the, the quality and skill that his uh, students show. And so he does that class every month. And then uh, he also has a basic black smithing class he does every month for us. Then what we have is the, the foundry. Now, foundry arts, this is something that is as old as Roman times and before, okay? 
Um, the idea here is, is that you create a casting uh, and the casting can be uh, something that is of utility or an art object or both. The steps involved is you create a pattern first. So you can carve, print, print in the, with a 3D printer or in other, other words, fabricate a pattern. So you can make it out of wood, whatever. You make it out of wax. And then you create a mold. Now this, we're talking sand casting here. Uh, there's many different types of casting. What we do right now is sand casting where we make coal, the, the, the mold from sand. And then you melt and pour the metal into the mold. And then you break the casting out of the mold. Um, and then the final step is that you remove the sprues, gates, and runners. Now, what's a well, I'm going to show you that in a moment. But the sprue is where you pour the metal in, and the gates where the metal flows, and the runners allow the air, air to escape. And then you, you uh, grind and finish the casting. And to get out all the unwanted parts on it and smooth it up, give it a nice uh, texture. And then you can apply a finish or patina to it, okay? So what we have right here is a simple pattern. Now this is a little object art. Um, and over on the left, why you can see these two small patterns. Patterns are typically made in multiple parts. And this, these two patterns, or th these two pieces are symmetrical and form a single pattern. Uh, in, the, in the middle shot, what you see is uh, uh, Mario there, his, he is pressing his pattern into that sand and setting it up uh, and smoothing it out for uh, uh, one half. And then what they do is then they take all that sand and fill around that uh, and pound that sand flat, okay? Uh, and uh, make a, a good solid uh, form. And so over on the right, what you see is the two halves of the pattern put together. Um, and, uh, but uh, uh, that was just simply for a, a, a photo opportunity. That's not how it would be applied in practice. We'll take the next slide here. And you can see this is what it looks like. So with both of those halves, um, being uh, with the sound, sound, the sand pounded around those patterns, then they can be put back together. Okay, uh, there's a mating, uh, mating pins here to form that, make that go all back together properly. And so now, then, what he's done is he's removed the pattern to form the this this space here, uh, where the metal will be poured into. And he's using a little tool to carve out uh, some areas in the sand to allow the path for the metal to flow. So now then, what's ready to do is they're they're heating up the metal while all this stuff, all the work on the on the molds is going forward, and they're heating up the metal. And now then, what you see is the the hot the crucible with that hot metal inside and being picked up with this special tool, okay? And so he pulls that up out of the melt furnace. And here, what we see is the, the crucible in these tongs and being, he's tilting, tilting that crucible to pour the metal into the mold. And you can see it's very, very hot. Uh, it's around, uh, 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 2300 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere around that. This is molten bronze, okay? It looks like that would, uh, that would get your attention while you're working with it, for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. As you can see, um, we pay a lot of attention to safety. We've got face shields. Uh, we've got um, all kinds of protective clothing. We're pouring that over sand. Uh, you don't want to be pouring molten metal over concrete. Uh, concrete and molten metal do not mix. So, okay, uh, you'll get ex little explosions. 
because there's moisture in the concrete. So now then that, that mold, that I'm sorry, that metal has cooled enough to break it out, break the casting out of the mold. And so now then you're just starting to see the different elements of the casting appear as the sand is broken away. And now you, over in the middle shot, you can see that's what that pattern kind of looked like. But this right here is a runner. So that allowed that metal to flow easy, okay, easily. This will glob up here. Uh, that's the sprue. That's where the metal was poured into. We don't have a good side picture, but there's a tube connecting this little blob on the right and down into the, this, this U shape. And so that tube is actually, made, of course, is molten bronze. And then it goes in and fills that pattern. And then, so that way, that way you aren't pouring directly into or disturbing the mold. It's just flowing in. That is correct, yeah. So you don't want any of the dynamic pressure from the molten metal uh, deforming the mold. And so it pours, you pour it in on the side and then allows the molten metal to run in. Now, you can just see over here on in this third photo, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see the top of, of that sprue, okay? And so there's that, uh, my, my mouse pointer is pointing kind of along that tube there that runs down into the gates, all right? Now these, these things, little wire type things sticking out here, those are air vents, okay? And so we can see that you, as you pour that metal in, well, that air has to be evacuated in some way. And so we've got those air vents in there to let the air out and to allow the metal to flow to all the corners of the mold. Now, are those air vents part of the original um, uh, uh, shape that you use to do the, uh, to make the mold from or? Right, no, no. The pattern, uh, the pattern is, let's jump back real quick. The pattern you, you notice here is that the, the pattern is, well, you can't, let's we'll go back one more. The pat, pattern is smooth. There's none of that, those lines or anything on there. But when you're putting the, uh, when you're preparing the mold right here, there will be air vents that will, with a small wire, you'll poke through uh, the sand out the other side, and so you form those those uh, pa air passages into the mold individually after you've removed the pattern from the sand. Okay, David, can I ask a real quick question? Absolutely. I, this sounds like a rather naive question, but what, this gets put on top of this, right? Uh, uh, the one yeah. gets put on. Exactly. How come? How, how come the sand doesn't run out? Um, it is a, a special formulation. Now, these particular photos in this process, they're using a compound called petrobond sand, okay? That has petroleum in it. And when you pour hot metal into it, it smokes. It's not, we just didn't feel really good about it being envir environmentally sound. And so we have gone to a new mixture of, um, of, of um, clay and very fine sand and water. But your question is, why doesn't that sand fall apart? Well, it is. it has enough stickiness, if you will, that it, it holds together in that form. Another reason is, is that these, these uh, uh, th this uh, aluminum uh, uh, frame, uh, that's called a, uh, well, some people call it a casket. Uh, other, other folks, uh, it has another name too. Come on, David, what is it? It is a, uh, um, I'll come back to it if I think of it. At any rate, uh, so those, those caskets, they have a slope to them uh, and they also have some ribs. And so when you turn them upside down, you have to do it carefully, but all that, that, that compressed sand holds right together again, due to the clay 
as well as the moisture in that mix. Okay. Did I answer your question? Great. So let's jump forward here a moment. So that's what that looks like uh, when it comes out of the uh, out of the mold, broke out of the mold. And then, of course, then there's a finish and some sanding operations, et cetera. And that, in this particular case, that's what this, this um, uh, casting turns out in its finished form. Okay. Oh, and that's where, so the, so the, um, the gate area is all mm -hmm. that's taken off of there, right? That, that's correct, because that was not part of the original uh, design. And so that would have been sawn off. Uh, likewise, those uh, air uh, vents, mm -hmm. uh, those wires, those would have been nipped off and then that would have been smooth, smoothed. The surface of the casting would have been smoothed with a combination of sandpaper, grinders, uh, use a saw to separate the sprue uh, from the, from the uh, casting body uh, and remove any other unwanted parts. Uh, also, cool. sometimes sometimes we'll have to do some filling as well, and so that can also happen. Uh, and you fill it uh, typically with with uh, a similar type of bronze wire, uh, heating it up with a torch or whatever. When you're working with this, David, it's mostly metal that you're working with. You don't do glass and stuff like that, do you? No, this is strictly metal for what we're doing in the foundry, uh, and we're only doing um, aluminum and bronze. Uh, we don't, do not have enough uh, heat in our melt furnace to melt uh, steel or iron. Uh, so, yeah. Now, uh, again, you know, the forge, while being right next door, there we work, work almost exclusively with steel. Okay. So, um, as I said, you know, that's, that was the forge and foundry, but we also have the sheet metal welding and plasma cutting that we do. And that's um, in barn uh, right there in the main facility. And so we have, um, all of our shops are pretty tight. Uh, they don't, we don't have a lot of space. And so, you know, it's always, trying to get the most out of the space we have. But we have some, uh, in, the, in the sheet metal shop, we have a nice big bench that we can build, on, build small or little stuff on. We do classes in here, um, uh, but so sheet metal is, is, is thin. Uh, we're talking um, less than a 16th of an inch thick. That's pretty heavy sheet metal. That would be 16 gauge. Uh, but we work normally between uh, in, uh, 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 28 to 20 gauge. Uh, 28 gauge is 1 64th of one inch thick. So it ranges in that range between 28 gauge and 16 gauge. And that's how we speak of in sheet metal. It's, it's in gauge. Uh, above, above 10 gauge, why then we start measuring it in, um, in fractions of an inch. And so here we just, you know, standard stuff, you know, hammer, file. Uh, we have, this, of course, a big break back here behind Linda here in the purple shirt on the left-hand screen. There's a big break there. Uh, there's a rolling, uh, a bead roller over here on the right in this first photo. Uh, so all kinds of stuff. And in this case, well, uh, we had a class to uh, make a, uh, a pizza um, um, Reed, what that's what's that called when you have a uh, have a, a maybe a paddle or a... yeah yeah there's a there's a specific name for it and I forget what it is right now but it's like a big pizza spatula <laughs> so, there you go <laughs> anyway that's the wrong name but that's what's going on and you can see yeah, if people just are really enthused about the stuff they create and uh, it, it's it's good fun. So what we yeah, also I'm sure it can be very satisfying if you think of yourself as somebody who hasn't had a lot of that kind of experience to mm -hmm. have a specific class and a project and say, look what I figured out here. Look what yeah. these people helped me learn how to do. 
Yes, well, that's a, that's absolutely right, Reed. Uh, um, and you know, we got people coming through with uh, little uh, background in metal, or we have people that spent their careers working in metal, and everywhere in between. And so uh, it's uh, it's gratifying to. St the greatest thing about Barn is the people that come through and the people that come, the people that volunteer. Uh, we we have um, uh, we're, we're we're blessed by the the uh, the energy and volunteerism and helpfulness and wanting to participate and uh, uh, so the, both the students and and people who teach the students so. It's 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 quite wonderful. So this is the welding shop, and so while a minute ago we were we were looking um, uh, east uh, in in Jaws uh, in Jack Archer Workshop, and so here we're looking south, uh, and so this is one room. It's not real large. It's probably 25 feet long and 15 feet wide. So it's it's not big. Um, we have a lot of stuff crammed here in here. There are four uh, teaching uh, or student workstations for welding. Uh, and then we have an instructor station as well. So we're limited to a maximum of four students in our welding um, uh, welding um, uh, shop. Um, and here, what they're working on this, they're doing MIG welding here. And so people are just, you know, learning how to uh, uh, make a bead. And you can see here, I can't zoom in on this, but uh, these, these little pieces of metal over here on this bench, uh, the gentleman on the right, well, those are, those metal pieces are called coupons. And he's making beads, just learning how to run a bead with a MIG welder. MIG is metal inert gas, okay? And so uh, the, the, the welding part comes in through controlled electrical power through the electrode, and then uh, the gas goes around the electrode uh, to keep uh, to evacuate or remove uh, any oxygen in that space uh, so that uh, you get a good solid uh, weld and no oxidation happening. And so that's why the oxygen is removed or the air is removed from around that. And that's what that inert gas does. And so when you're, when you're practicing that way, he's looking to try to be more proficient so that when he actually goes to weld something, they'll be able to make that nice clean bead that won't oxidize. Or... That, that's, that's precisely right, yeah. And of course, these arcs, uh, these electrical arcs are extremely bright, a lot of heat. Um, and so the, the hoods that you see uh, these folks wearing, uh, these are auto sensing and so they're extremely, they, they respond extremely quickly to bright flashes of light. And when you start welding, you can barely see the, the weld. I mean, the, you have a, a bright spot, but it's, very, it's a challenge to learn how to move that, that, um, that electrode in a straight line and melt that puddle of steel or, or metal because that's what you're doing. You're using the, the heat from that electrode to melt the metal and you, you create a puddle of molten metal and you drag that along. And normally you would have two pieces that you're joining together. Uh, but in this case, these folks are just learning how to run, run a straight bead. And uh, it's a challenge, it really is. It takes practice. So here's some more photos of that. And, you know, you can see it just blows out the, uh, the, the, the image on the photograph. Just you know, burns it right, white, white, white and blue. But uh, that's what you put the, that, that was good. That was Port Mondo. You had a yeah. white yeah. and blue together. Oh, yeah. 
Blue. And then on the on the right hand side here, you can see he has just removed his electrode from that bead. Okay, and so he he just ran this bead right here. Now he was also trying to uh, he or she I don't know which. We have a lot of women coming through our classes as well. But you can barely see the beads joining this upright piece of metal with this uh, metal lying flat. And there's a nice bead right there, it looks like. But then there's a discontinuity. And then there's some more. And then this bead right here, I'm not quite sure what was he was. Oh, I see. This two. He's got two coupons here. But it looks like he missed it because you can barely see the seam right there. And he was off to the right just a little bit on that seam. As I said, it's a challenge to see what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. And so here's some more. Now there's a little bit more complex. This person is moving right along. So here we've got uh, on the left, lower left hand, you can see that piece of metal flat on the bench. And then you got two verticals that have been joined by those beads. And now then he's putting or she's putting a cap on that to actually make a, 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 a square uh, frame uh, by welding all the corners together. And OK, and so here's the same gentleman and I can see him now. And so here's his face and here's the instructor. And you can see, you know, just tickled about what he's accomplished there, you know, and it's, it's, it's good work. It's good work. Great. And so uh, what we also do uh, in JAWS is we, so there's sheet metal, there's welding, and then there's also plasma cutting. So what is plasma cutting? Well, plasma is a very high temperature um, it's, it's actually a state. So you have water, solid water is a state, vapor is a state, and ice is a state. Well, plasma is its own state. And plasma is, it has no, let's see, I'm sorry, let me say this right. Uh, plasma has, uh, all of its ions are free. So it has, it is a, 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 an ion, um, Ion free gas is what it is, and it's uh, it's very hot, and it's created by a um, uh, by a, uh, a high um, um, what's sorry I'm fumbling here. Um, it is created by an electrical charge, okay, and that electrical charge. Uh, is between, so we've got a cathode and anode here. And so this nozzle is that the, pow the power from that current is creating that plasma. Now, but what has to, and it's also that you can see the kerf that, that that plasma cutter is creating. And so what is going on though, is that there is a blast of air that accompanies that plasma gas and it blows away the metal in its path. So as it heats up, the metal melts and then the, the hot, the, the, the compressed air blasts that metal away. So you can see she's all suited up here. She's got her, her hood on, she's got her, her, her gloves on and that's being done over a water bed. And you can see that over time, these, these grids that this metal is sitting on, they get eaten away by this plasma, by this hot, hot gas. It's uh, the, the, the hot plasma melting those grids, support grids over the water table. Yeah, it looks almost like it's, uh, it might be like a um, barbecue kind of a setup there. Yeah, it, actually it is. It's, it's, uh, uh, it, it's similar to that. Uh, those, uh, these, this grid that you see that the hammer's laying on here, those are one eighth inch wide and an inch and a half deep. So they're, you know, they're, it goes down quite a ways. Then the water is about two inches below the bottom of that. And so basically, there you go, beautiful. Yeah, so she's in the process here of cutting out this, 
uh, this design that she's uh, drawn up. And I would imagine what she's going to do is take some of those parts then and she'll weld those up into some kind of uh, uh, a piece of yard art or something. I don't know what she's got in mind here, but that's what she's doing. And then she could go on here and then polish those things, or she could uh, put a patina on these, um, any number of uh, things that she could do or paint them. But in all likelihood, she will apply some kind of a patina uh, to the metal. All right. And then so then finally, the machine shop. The machine shop is where I spend most of my time. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, we have lathes and mills. Uh, this is the, the door going into the machine shop. And we've got a student here. And they're actually working on making a hammer. Uh, I don't know whether I've got a photograph of that. I don't believe I do. So what you see over here on the left-hand image is a mill. That's a vertical mill. And it is, uh, it's called a knee mill, actually, because the table down about knee height goes up and down. So it, that's what it does. And then there's a table that sits on top of that, that knee. And that table then will move in and out toward the, the mill, but it'll also move back and forth in this direction as well. So that's the X, the Y, and the Z. And then it has a quill in here as well that goes up and down. And there's a cutter in that, in, that, in that spindle right there. Then on the right, is, uh, is, our, is one of our lathes. This is a Harding lathe. It's a tool room lathe. It's this, this lathe is used to make other tools. It's that kind of precision instrument. Uh, it uh, does a great, great job. It's a, it's a joy to run and we're fortunate to have it. So we just finished. Um, so we, as I said, we've got some mills. This is a, another mill. This is a, a bridge port. That other mill is a bridge port type as well. This is the um, bridge port is kind of the generic term, the way that we used to, when we were kids, why we would call facial tissues, we call them Kleenex, right? Well, bridge port is the, is the quote Kleenex of mills. Okay, and so you say you got a bridge port. Well, do you really have a bridge port or do you have a knockoff? You know, do you have a, <laughs> you know, who knows? But so we, we, this, uh, this mill on the left was donated to us uh, about a year and a half ago. And so it was, it was kind of a mess. Uh, it was rusty. Uh, the paint was in bad shape. Uh, it, it needed some tender, loving care. But the guts of the machine were quite, quite good. And so we uh, accepted the donation and then we did a, a major overhaul of the machine. We stripped it all down and painted it. We took the head apart. We did some repairs on it. Um, here you can see the table more clearly. This too is a knee mill. The table goes up and down. And then there's a vice sitting up here on this table. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> excuse me, and so this handle right over here on left-hand side, that will move the table back and forth in this direction. And then this handle right here will move the table in and out uh, to and toward the mill base and away from the mill base. And then this is the spindle and this is the head. It stays stationary and there's a, there's a, a quill in a, uh, aligned in the spindle and it can be can go up and down as well and it can be used as a drill press or it can hold cutters to that we cut a lot of aluminum a lot of a lot of uh, steel on on this machine that's it's a great tool and then we have a cnc mill and again cnc computer numerical control and so you'll see that there is a computer screen here attached to this mill. There's a keyboard and a mouse. And so we take uh, code, it's called G 
code G hyphen C O D E. And we we can write G code or we can use other software to create G code based on a 3D design or whatever, three dimensional uh, image model of, of what we want to create. And then the machine will move as we tell it to in the X, in the Y, and the Z. Now, this is a bed mill. The bed does not go up and down, but rather the head goes up and down. And you can see this accordion-like affair here, and that allows the, keeps the ways covered to keep crap out of there, keep uh, chips and things, but the head can go up and down. All right, and then we have our CNC lathe as well. Not the best image, little greeny, <clears throat> but it's a small it's a small lathe. But again, you see the computer screen here, uh, and uh, it, it's a, it's a great tool. And I I teach all these classes on the CNC stuff. And so uh, you can either you, you said in some cases you're learning to uh, actually write the instructions. And in other cases, you can use a template or something uh, that mm -hmm. is going to create uh, what you want to with the, with the computer driven lathe or mill. Now, that is correct, yes. Okay. And so um, we seldom write G code programs manually. Mm -hmm. Now we do put G code commands into the machine one at a time to move the table or turn the spindle on. <clears throat> but those are when we are doing specific things and it's typically just to um, uh, move the machine to where we want it. Uh, specific small tasks. Most all of the time, we'll use software, modeling software. We use something known as Fusion 360. So, and we can draw up a model of what we want to machine. And then we go through and we'll take that model and then call specific tools that are in, in the library on this machine. And then we'll call that tool from its library and we'll identify the holes that we want to drill or the profile we want to mill. And then that program will then output our G code program that we load into the machine to run. And then we'll proceed to run and cut the part. And it does it with great precision. And if you want to do a second one or a third one, why it'll turn out just like the first one. So as I was talking earlier, um, when we, that first image of the machine shop, why we have that young woman in there, she was making a hammer. Well, this is the design for the hammer. And so we have a knurled handle here and then a long shaft. And then the, the, the hammer head is here, right? And then we have thread operation. So a hole is drilled and a, a flat is milled rather on the hammer head. And then the hole is drilled and then that is tapped or threads are cut into that hammer head. Likewise, there are threads cut into this shaft. And then you thread, once that, that has been done, why then you can screw the handle into the head firmly and you've got a hammer. And so people make these heads out of brass uh, or may make uh, the head out of aluminum and have a brass face on one and a plastic face on the other. It's up to you on how you wanna make your head. But that's one of the classes that we teach. And that's what you see Stan and uh, Mark working on right here. He's, he's turning, this, uh, turning the, um, uh, the handle on, on the lathe. And I think he's in the process of measuring that. So that's what Stan does when he's not down here singing at the senior center. <laughs> that's it. That's it exactly right. Yeah, Stan's quite the guitar player. Yeah, yeah, and singer. And so, yeah, and so here you see Stan's hands are in here 
around that shaft with his digital calipers. You can see the digital side, but he's measuring the diameter of that shaft and he's determining whether or not they've taken that handle down far enough. Now here you see, this is Peter Mosley on the left and stands on the right. And the young woman here, she is doing the work on her hammer head. And I'm not quite sure specifically what operation she's doing, but they're instructing her on how to do this properly. But you can see they've got the drill and tap set here. And so I suspect that they're finished milling the flat and they're getting ready to drill and tap the, hand, uh, the hammer head. This is, uh, something, this is another photo of Stan. Uh, and he uh, has what's known as the little hot air engine. Uh, and this little engine can be run from uh, compressed air as well. And so here, um, that's, you can see it in Stan's hand. It's a finished um, uh, engine uh, mounted on a block of wood. And he's talking to a student here. And here you can see the flywheel on of of the little uh, air engine and uh, you know it's a it's a nice little flywheel very pretty um one of the big projects that i've worked on over the last um uh, two years is we built our own 3d printer and so let's take a pause here and talk about what a 3D printer is. A 3D printer, rather than removing material, such as what we see in this middle photo, removing material to produce this form, what a 3D printer does is it uses additive machining, okay? It takes material and it adds and keeps building up on a base and, and builds that up and builds that up till you get the form that you want, that you designed in your 3D software program. And so the fill, the, the, you build it up with a filament and the filament is um, about a 16th of an inch in diameter. Okay, so not very big. Um, and it is pushed through a hot nozzle. And that nozzle melts that, that filament and then builds up the form that you've programmed. And the machine controls, and it's, it's just like that mill. It has, and over here on the left-hand photo, well, you can see we've got inside this, this, this drawing, this is a 3D uh, drawing of that machine that we built. So that this thing right here is the head and there X moves in the X direction. It can move in the Y direction. And then the table goes up and down for the Z direction. So you've defined a 3D space. And so the machine knows how to move while it's heating that, that filament and depositing that melted filament to build the form one small diameter at a time, building it up, building it up, building it up until you have a 3D object completed. I wish I had a sample and I don't think I do in this in set, but maybe I do, I'll look. Anyway, so here what we've done is on that big CNC mill, you can we cut out this 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 piece right here uh, on the right hand side, and this is the crossbar, and that is supporting that that uh, carriage and slide on in the x axis. That's what that piece is, and so we've cut that piece out of solid aluminum on that CNC mill. So you can see it did a pretty good job. So here's the electronics part. That's not finished. There's a lot more electronics that goes into that, but it's part way done. And then over on the right hand side, here's a photo of the of the actual unit. And here 
you can see, and this is a pretty good example of, I said I didn't have a sample, but I do. So this is, I think, about a four inch by four inch uh, plate, and it is slowly building up. And this is, it, it laid down a substrate, a solid substrate, and now then it has an infill, and it is slowly infilling with a different material back and forth, back and forth. And then the next layer, it'll do another crosshatch this way. And that's what that's doing. It's building up a, a uh, some object. And I don't remember what that is. But you used a tool to build a tool. That's it. That's it exactly. And we do that quite often in the machine shop. Oh, look, there's a little movie here. There you can see it moving. <laughs> I forgot I had that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's pretty slick. Let's see if yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, very good. And so here's and here's we're another part. So this is actually parts of it's another part of uh, we're making for its itself. It's uh, it's part of a grid to hold the filament spools, and <clears throat> this is a. Uh, this is another example. So we made uh, 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 window openers for our high um, atrium windows uh, at barn. And, you know, they're, you know, 16 feet up, 18 feet up above the floor. And they're not automated, at least they weren't. And so we built automated um window openers. And so the window is attached to, to one end of this rack. And then there's a pinion gear and a motor and a control system that moves, <coughs> excuse me, moves that rack back and forth. That's what that does. So yeah, every day. Yeah. And here's, here's a better photo of it. Here's a really, and here we're making some tall enclosures. We had to raise this, this, uh, um, we had to raise the uh, window openers up a bit. So we are printing 3D bases. So, you know, there's the, the, the base, we're screwing it down, we're printing two at a time. And so you screw those down and then the, this, the, the window opener then gets glued onto this box. So, and here's the finished item. So we can see the base and there's the motor and the gear is inside here and it moves that rack back and forth. There you go. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah, and the, the window is attached to this little thing right here. More 3D printed parts. Great. Yeah, cool stuff. And there they are. Uh, not a great photo, but that's that's what they look like. <laughs> 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 yeah all right and then i think we're getting close to being done here but there's a couple more we we do quite a few community projects in fact I, I think i've got two of my jobs list right now um and but two years ago three years ago uh, we embarked on a big project and it was to rebuild the ascension angle axes uh, mechanism for the Battle Point Observatory Telescope. This is the Ritchie Telescope. Um, I don't know if you folks have any uh, uh, knowledge of, of that, but the Ritchie Telescope was built, um, I think it was in the early 80s. It was built from some surplus Star Wars uh, Reagan Star Wars initiative. Um, and it was a surplus 27 inch, actually it was a 30 some inch piece of glass. And that uh, was reshaped and reground to 27 inches. And it comprises the base element of the Ritchie telescope. Um, and so, but the, the, uh, drive mechanism for the ascension angle axis uh, system uh, was not accurate. And uh, they would point it to a, a known star 
and you'd still have to hunt for it even after it had been uh, pointed to the where it's supposed to be and that just wasn't working and so uh, this whole system was rebuilt by the barn um, metal fabrication machine shop and welding shop. Uh, this big gold gear here uh, was uh, farmed out because it was beyond our capability, but all this other stuff, why we did in-house. What an amazing public service. That's great. Yeah, yeah, it was a big project, and, uh, but it, and it is in service now. It works great, and we're quite proud of the work we did. And here, here's a photo of the, of the Ritchie uh, prior to it being taken out of service uh, during the retrofit. And here's that big gold gear I was telling you about. And this foam wrapping around this gold thing is, is, um, is where a pinion gear runs in along these teeth around this gear. Uh, here's some more parts that were made. Uh, these are two ends. Uh, one was, uh, we screwed up one, so we had to do it again. Uh, but that's what those parts are for. Oh, and here you can see the gear teeth on the right. And this is where the, the, the gold gear is being installed on the axes. And you can see that's pretty fine gear. And that's a helical, uh, helical gear there that, that uh, 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 worm drive uh, will move that telescope right to where it needs to be. That's great. Yeah, good stuff. And we, we also have some fun toys. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, we do. And I'm gonna, I wanna show you these. Uh, these are antique models, okay? And so you can see here, um, we, they're just so much fun. Uh, and so we turn these on when we have people come through or, you know, show them, show folks what, what, what we, what we've got. And, uh, anyway, it's, uh, <laughs> things that move, things that move. And, you know, that's what a lot of what mechanical engineering is all about. Yeah. 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 So anyway, and I think, oh, okay. This one is a little bit, oh, oh, it's doing it again for some reason. Let's let's get let's get beyond that. Okay. Oh well, I think this is it goes in for a little bit close up, and you can see, and that's the that's the governor that's spinning there, and the big flywheel. Yep. Okay. Good. So. Of course, I was supposed to be doing this for um, uh, in December, <clears throat> and so <clears throat> I had uh, season's greetings, uh, and and so our two little friends here were going to wish everyone uh, season's greetings, uh, but I changed it just a little bit here, and so we've got best wishes for a good 2022. Um, Thank you. Yeah, lovely guys there, <laughs> aren't they? And this is another one of our creative folks, and he does a wacky tacky make a pet, and so here we are. <laughs> That's great. That's great, David. And um, I just, I just uh, wanted to uh, mention. So Jack Archer of the Jack Archer Workshop uh, was one of the founders, right? Um. He was uh, a, at least a supporter of Barn. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, he was a, he was a big supporter, uh, and he donated all of that sheet metal equipment, and that's one of the reasons that Barn has a sheet metal shop. Absolutely. I should also say uh, that uh, Peter Mosley uh, donated many of the machines in the machine shop. Um, that big mill. Uh, that really nice lathe, uh, you know, surface grinder, a lot of supporting tools. So he donated stuff, uh, all that stuff to Barn as well. So we've been uh, graced with uh, a lot of generous folks uh, in uh, giving away, uh, giving their, their tools and uh, things that they made a living with or uh, had as a primary hobby of giving to Barn. And they continue on in, in their next life. 